Good evening and welcome to tonight's Mary Scott lecture featuring Dr. Antoine Balliard. We thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Karen Atler and I am associate professor in the occupational therapy department, which is located in the College of Health and Human Sciences here at Colorado State University. I will be our moderator for tonight's event. I'm pleased to begin our event this evening with acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native nations. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is a land-grant institution and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion. And significantly, that our founding came at a dire cost to Native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. Before I introduce Dr. Bundy, who will introduce our speaker, I'd like to just inform you of how our evening will unfold. Dr. Balliard will provide about a 45 minute presentation and that will be followed by a 30 minute question and answer session. We welcome you to begin posting your questions in the Q&A at any time during the presentation. Dr. Arlene Schmidt and I will be monitoring the Q&A and we'll do our best to ensure everyone's questions get answered. Please note that there will be a slight lag between the video and the audio between questions and answers. That's normal and we appreciate, uh, thank you in advance for your understanding of that. Now it is my pleasure to present Dr. Anita Bundy, the head of the Occupational Therapy Department who will introduce Dr. Antoine Balliard. Thank you for joining us this evening for the Mary Scott Lecture. A little bit of background. The Mary Scott Lecture is sponsored by the College of Health and Human Sciences. It is awarded yearly through a competitive process. Mary Scott was a social worker, YMCA administrator, and member of CSU's governing board. She endowed this lecture series in 1984. I am grateful to the college for awarding the 2021 lecture to occupational therapy. And now I'm honored to introduce this year's Mary Scott lecturer. Dr. Antoine Balliard is Associate Professor of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His clinical work focuses on enhancing quality of life, community integration, 
and participation with adults with mental illness. In his research, Dr. Balliard and participants work together to learn about relationships among sensory experiences, mental health, and participation in meaningful activity. He is engaged in multiple projects, providing outreach and supports to adults who are homeless or at risk of being homeless in North Carolina and Los Angeles. Dr. Balliard's Mary Scott lecture is entitled yeah. Stabilization Through Participation, How Meaningful Activities Promote Mental Health, Wellness, and Belonging. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Antoine Balliard. Thank you very much for the, the, uh, the introduction. It's a tremendous honor to be here. And uh, I apologize if we run into any uh, little hiccups with the technology, such as the time. I'm told that you can see the uh, PowerPoint at the moment. Um, and so I think we're ready to go. OK, so, you know, today I I'm going to talk about something that's not at all rocket science. It's something actually that you really intuitively know and that uh, you tend to organize your life around anyway. Yet our health system tends to ignore uh, this, uh, this significant aspect of our lives. And it's really about how participation can, um, can facilitate uh, positive mental health and well-being. So let's see, I'm making sure that my slides are moving. We're, here we go. Okay, so uh, just a quick outline. Um, we will be discussing really quick some research on meaningful participation and friendship and belonging as medical necessities. Then I'll uh, discuss really quickly uh, the impact of COVID-19 because it's impossible to mention such a thing without discussing the impact of COVID on participation. And then I'll uh, introduce some strategies for supporting meaningful participation. We'll talk about positive psychology, the recovery model, um, action over inertia, which is actually uh, an intervention that came out of occupational therapy, some risk management, and then how technology can support participation. So hopefully by the end, you will have learned something and maybe something that you can apply in your own lives. That is certainly the point here. Um, and again, I apologize, this is not rocket science. So you likely know most of the lessons that I'm going to be talking about here, but it's nice to have research to actually back it up and show that there's substance here and that your intuition is actually based on something that is real and proven by science. But before I actually begin, I feel like I really need to discuss the rates of mental illness. And the situation is dire. The numbers are going up. Adults with any mental illness in the past 10 years, so between 2008 and 2019, so more than that, um, went up uh, by 3%, approximately 12 million uh, people. That is a tremendous amount. Young adults with uh, any mental illness, the percentage went up by 11, and that's around 4 million people. That's really significant if you think about it. That means one in five people has a certain form of mental illness. Now, when we start talking about serious mental illness, uh, the numbers are lower, but we're also talking about the type of mental illness that uh, significantly affects your ability to function in society. So a lot of folks with serious mental illness have trouble maintaining jobs. Many have jobs, but some have trouble maintaining jobs, maintaining um, uh, education and engagement in the community. And these numbers have gone up as well, 2.5%, around 5 million, and among young adults, 5%, uh, around 1.7 million. So we need to act and we need to act now because the numbers are increasing and it's predominantly driven by young adults. So let's move forward. Now, again, we're gonna be talking about meaningful participation here and friendship and belonging as medical necessities. This is something we're not used to doing because the medical model tends to focus on fixing the person, healing the person, curing the person, often targeting symptoms directly. Uh, the mental health system also tends to traumatize people, uh, not, not all the time, but I have many uh, people that I've worked with who will report that being admitted on an inpatient unit is a traumatic experience itself, and being diagnosed with a mental illness at an early age and seeing your cohort with whom you grew up move along a different life trajectory is also traumatic. What we do know, though, is the current system is not working very well as we see that the stats continue uh, to um, go up, so we really need to, uh, to think about preventative measures here and participation, friendship, and belonging are exactly that. Now, this is not a new topic. It's just one that hasn't received sufficient attention. The uh, World Health Organization in 2001 came out with the International Classification of Health Functioning and Disease, and they posited that health is a result of, um, of 
bo uh, body function and structure, a person's ability to execute activities, and their participation or their involvement in life situations. Therefore, health, according to the WHO, well, uh, 20 years ago, is actually the complete physical, mental, and social functioning of a person. It's not just the absence of disease. So we really need to move beyond this perception that health means no disease. It's not. It's complete physical, mental, and social functioning of a person. So just to give an idea of what this looks like, uh, they came out with this model, and here's the ICF model where you see the interaction, interaction between the components. And the reason I'm showing you this is so that you can see where they're really showing how participation activities and body function and structures are given the same weight in generating a health condition or a disorder or disease. Of course, environmental factors and personal factors are involved as well, but I think it's very important because our healthcare system tends to focus only on that left side of that model only on body functions and structures when we really need to be also addressing activities and participation. So this has been around for quite a while. When we're talking about mental illness, here's an example of what it would look like with a panic disorder. So you look at the left, the problem with the body structure would be perhaps a problem with your emotional functions. In terms of activities that would translate to a difficulty in handling stress or other psychological demands, and this would also affect your uh, ability to participate in social activities. So you would have restricted social relationships. Now these things feed into each other. They're bi-directional even more than that. So uh, it's you can't just say that one causes the other, but it's actually this very complex complex gestalt of, of an experience. Now, more and more academics uh, and clinicians are clamoring for considering participation as a medical necessity. There's even an anti-psychiatry movement where people who have been involved in psychiatric systems are, are pushing back and saying that they, uh, they have been mistreated and that the move, uh, that psychiatry has over-medicalized uh, treatment and, you, and um, leveraged medication too much. Um, instead of solely focusing on mental health service, people are increasingly clamoring for the need to support participation and integration in community life. This quote from Rapp in 1996, I think, captures it perfectly, that people don't need more referrals to mental health services. A lot of those already exist. What they really need are referrals to life and community. And that is, is, is really the crux of this whole talk right here. Dr. Salzer at the bottom uh, also, who has done a tremendous amount of work in community um, in promoting community participation for adults with mental illness, he uh, uh, strongly advocates that uh, all people, including people with mental illness, should have the opportunity to live in the community and be valued for their uniqueness and ability, just like everyone. And currently, that's not the, the situation we live in. So how, how do we promote uh, participation? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. But first, we're going to talk about like why is participation so important? Why are we so hardwired to be into uh, spending time with others? And it's, be it's because we have a social brain. We are born very underdeveloped compared to most animals. In fact, we're very dependent on our caregivers for survival and allostatic uh, regulation, which means when we're hungry, we, we can't secure food on our own. We cry for food. We cry for comfort. We're cold. We cry for temperature regulation. We can't do these things on our own, and we would certainly perish without our caregivers. So as we developed, us as we as infants come to associate social stimuli with allostatic regulation. This hardwires the brain to highly value any social interaction. And then as time goes, higher order forms of social participation become associated with having your basic needs met. So you can see, so from the beginning, it's not something that society, uh, that is like socioculturally developed. It's actually a basic human need due to our dependence on our caregivers. Now, <clears throat> Research on participation is scant, but the, the research that does exist ha has proven that uh, it matters. Um, we know that quality of life is related to participation, that uh, people who uh, report sufficient participation on measures also report a significantly qual uh, higher quality of life. It's not the same thing as health, but it's, it's very closely tied to health. We also know that loneliness, which is usually because of lack of participation, leads to a higher use of healthcare has poor uh, deleterious effects on physical and mental health and is actually considered one of the leading causes of mortality. I'm going to get back to the uh, to the importance of loneliness later in this talk because we're actually in the middle of a loneliness epidemic. And this was uh, said before uh, the current pandemic that we're experiencing. Um, we know that inclusion makes life more meaningful and that people who participate in meaningful activities have the opportunity to build social connections and that exclusion generally makes life less meaningful. 
uh, simple studies uh, were, uh, with an experimental game of catch, for example, where uh, you have a group of people throwing the ball around to each other and only one person is not given the ball, that that person subsequently reports having a less meaningful experience and not felt in and included. And, and so that just demonstrated a very simple form of exclusion can create a form of, uh, of lack of well-being in the moment. And research shows that this exclusion, the reason that it makes life most meaningful is because of the lack of social participation that's at the core of it. And we also know that social isolation is, is related to cognitive decline. So what kinds of participation do we need? Well, it's very obvious. I think everyone's heard that physical activities are important for mental and physical health, even in small amounts. Light, moderate, and vigorous intensity exercises are known to reduce anxiety, depression, and negative mood. Anyone uh, in the crowd now who uh, does, um, who works out or has some form of exercise probably can attest to this. It definitely improves self-esteem uh, and cognition. And uh, research has even shown that even three minutes of light exercise can, can increase this subjective well experience of folks. In a very large study with about 1.2 million uh, people demonstrated that those who exercise have 43.2% fewer days of poor mental health. That is significant. So uh, we saw that the largest effect in, the, in this study also was with social activities, so popular team sports, cycling, and gym activities. So we really see here that exercise is important, but the social nature of exercise is even more important. Um, in adults with SMI, uh, interventions that uh, provide sport uh, have provided people with opportunities to restore their lives and to interact with others to build a positive uh, ident identity and sense of self, which is something that adults with SMI often don't get to experience because they usually receive a message very early on that they uh, are will probably be unable to participate in work and have a same meaningful life that most individuals have. I've had many people tell me this, that this is the message they got upon their diagnosis. So supporting participation is key. Now, physical activity, of course, is related to animal companionship. Um, for example, so I used to never work out and then I got a small puppy husky, which was a tremendously wonderful experience. But I didn't realize how much energy a puppy husky uh, had. And so I started having to run the dog so that it wouldn't destroy my home. And then I started having to do this several times a week. And now my my poor dog, he's 12 years old and he doesn't go on those runs anymore, but I've formed a habit since. And now I'm still doing these activities. And so for me, having a, an animal, having uh, a dog led to uh, a very big change in my physical activity. People report this all the time, walking the dog, uh, getting out and moving is, is a definitely a beneficial uh, aspect of animal companionship, having a, um, a dog. But it's, a, but it's more than that. Actually having an animal, having a dog, Research shows that it leads to better community integration, that people see their pets as family members, and that very importantly as well, that they facilitate interactions with community members. It gives you something to talk about. It gives you, uh, uh, when you're having an awkward moment, you can focus on the dog. Um, I had a person in one of my um, one of my recent studies, an, an adult with schizophrenia who had just recently had a, a dog, and he would say how prior to having a dog, when he would walk around the neighborhood, he would be filled with paranoia and wondering what were people thinking of him walking around alone. He would say things like, "Oh, they must think that I'm a, that I'm up to no good, or that um, you know uh, that I'm a weird person." And then after getting a dog, he found that he no longer had that feeling. He just felt like a, just a regular guy walking his dog. He also found that he, he was um, needing to look up and interact with people walking their dogs as well to prevent any potential uh, uh, negative reaction, interactions with other dogs. It also provided him an opportunity to talk to those other dog owners. As a dog owner myself, uh, going to the dog park, I can tell you I've formed many friendships there uh, through the social opportunities it has created. I never anticipated how it would open such a world. So uh, research with adults with serious mental illness who have animals report that, you know, uh, they enjoy being able to talk to their pets without being judged. I think we can all relate to that too, that they get to share personal details without a worry of betrayal. Um, and certainly in uh, uh, assisted living facilities, there's plenty of research showing that there's a positive influence on self-esteem and, and empowerment. So having an animal and all the modes of participation that it can offer is a path towards mental health and physical health. And so is leisure, right? We always think about leisure as being something on the side that we get to do after our hard work is done. It's, a, it's not really all that important. It's just something for fun. But actually we know for a fact that leisure is healthy. 
Okay. Uh, uh, a very interesting study that came out with the Pittsburgh Enjoyable Activities Test, which measured uh, participation in di 10 different areas of leisure, different types. So social, outdoors, alone, different types of, uh, of uh, enjoyable activities demonstrated that people with higher uh, scores on the test had lower blood pressure, lower cortisol, lower waist circumference, lower BMI. They also had lower depression and negative affect and had a higher per a perception of their physical function and levels of positive so uh, psychosocial states. Um, we know that leisure prevents boredom. That's very obvious, but we also know that boredom is negative towards mental health and physical health. We, um, so leisure is important. We know that uh, leisure improves belonging, freedom, and a positive identity. And just the perception that you are actively engaged in leisure has been found to be a significant predictor of your mental and physical health. And when I say active living, OK, uh, active leisure activities, which are which are especially important, it's more than just active in the physical sense. It's uh, in these studies, they're talking about active in the, in the sense of being socially active, spiritually active and culturally active. So really engaged in your environment, engaged in the social and community fabric. So the, you know, the, the importance of leisures has been acknowledged at the highest levels of government, such that the uh, Australian Government Department of Health came out in 2019 and said, get a hobby because it lowers stress and, de and depressive symptoms. So I recommend we all do that, right? But as we know, the importance of leisure and meaningful activity is really highlighted by COVID. All the people that I know with a serious mental illness, when I uh, started describing my feelings uh, of no longer being able to participate in my favorite activities, no longer seeing my friends and family. All the people with SMI I know said, welcome to my world. Now you finally understand. And even then, still not enough. What they were referring to was just understanding that feeling of isolation, that inability to get out and do those meaningful things, the boredom, the loneliness. Those are the aspects that we couldn't understand. We certainly can't understand the stigma that's uh, associated with mental illness, but at least we captured a glimpse into the world of what it's like to be excluded and to not have activity. I think uh, that uh, COVID-19, as, as, as terrible as it's been uh, uh, on the world, has had a silver lining in highlighting the importance of mental health uh, among uh, all of our populations. And now people are more aware than ever on how losing activities, being bored and lonely and nothing to do can really, really, really affect your mental and physical health in ways that you would never anticipate, even feeling as, as strong and prepared as before. So the, all the research on uh, people who lose uh, uh, opportunities to participate shows that it's, it's a negative thing. But it's not just so simple as just losing uh, uh, the activity itself. In this study right here, for example, on caregivers for adults with dementia, it was the perceived uh, a perceived change in, in leisure and engagement was related with stress and, bur and burden. It led to depressive symptoms, anxiety, and lowered life satisfaction. But that membership in engaging in so, uh, in social uh, activities was protective against the effect of uh, negative effects of caregiving. So. Research has tend to show the, uh, that uh, caregiving for older adults with dementia is, is so burdensome that is a negative thing and that there's like caregiver burnout, but it's not actually the caregiving itself that is the burnout. The burden is the loss of engagement in meaningful activities and that those people who were able to maintain those meaningful activities, that meaningful participation, that the burden was not so great and they uh, had fewer uh, negative uh, impacts on mental health. Boredom is negative. Uh, it, you know, uh, we often say these days that we're not bored enough, but the research shows that if we're bored too much, that it is bad. Right here in this study with adults who are homeless, uh, there was a strong positive correlation between meaningful activity and mental well-being, where boredom was known, was found to drive substance abuse and poor mental well-being. In fact, and there was a strong negative correlation between boredom and a belonging in a person's community. So, you know, boredom obviously uh, is, is something that needs to be avoided because of the, the path to poor mental well-being and substance abuse, particularly for adults who are homeless. Now, I bring up these studies, you know, with adults with mental illness and adults who are homeless, and it's, it, it applies to all of us, correct? Right? Everyone is the same in this boat. In fact, social and community participation are so important that mental health researchers argue that uh, impairments in social functioning actually are among the most debilitating and treatment refractory aspects of schizophrenia, way more debilitating, according to some researchers, than the uh, the positive symptoms that we see. And when I say that, I mean delusions and hallucinations. Social uh, functioning has, found, is, has been found to be one of the strongest predictors of outcomes for this group. And actually, social competence at discharge has been a predictor of relapse uh, for uh, adults with schizophrenia. Yet it's something that we're not very good at working on with folks. 
So it's more than just having a resource uh, for support participation, having friends, having friends matters, right? It's a measure of being normal or actually you're having the best quality of life when you have someone to interact with. And I think it means that you have a lot better mental health because you have people you can talk to whenever something's troubling you. And that's sort of like a release valve. I forgot to say that this was a study with adults with serious mental illness and the importance of friendships to them. And this person was reflecting on what we usually think about with, with friends, right? That it's important to have friends for when you're feeling bad that you, you can lean on them and they'll comfort you and give you that release valve. But it's more than that, right? It's, it's healthy. It can raise your self-esteem and it can help you get out and be around in an environment and be around people so you're not stuck at home. It makes me feel warm and comfortable. So right here we see that having friends is more than just a resource for support. It is motivating. It encourages activity. Having friends matters because it makes us participate. And those forms of participation feed our friendships and contribute to our physical and mental well-being. All these things are related. So in the same study, Boyd L. and all really emphasized the, the, the reciprocal relationship between friendship and mental health, where you can see that uh, um, it takes having friends to experience good mental health, but you also need good mental health to be able to have friends. We found out very often that folks who have poor mental health have difficulty in maintaining friendships due to some of the social uh, skills that they uh, that they have. And uh, but we also know that informal friendship networks uh, contribute to, to recovery and therefore it's something that we really need to work on uh, to, to, to connect people to make sure that everyone has uh, uh, friends. Um, it contributes to that feeling of belonging. It's more than just the acceptance, you know, the, the, the relief of not having fear and rejection or shame. It's, it's, that, it's that needing to be needing, that reciprocal feeling. The fact that you are giving something to someone else. You're not just dependent on them, they're dependent on you. You matter. You know, and that goes for the same thing with animal companionship. Often we, uh, we, we say that adults with serious mental illness should not have animals, or many, you know, lay persons say, I shouldn't have an animal because of all the stress it adds. And yes, that's correct. It does have a stressful aspect of it. But there's something very important about all the opportunities for participation it offers. And there's something really important about having to get out of bed that morning because somebody needs you. That dog needs to be walked. That dog needs to be fed. And if you didn't do it, what would happen? Your life matters because that, per that person or animal needs you. These are things that cannot be underestimated. Okay, I promised I would return to the loneliness epidemic and here we are. Sadly, we are in the middle of a loneliness epidemic. And you know, the word sounds awful right now because we've been dealing with this pandemic that's been going on. But this is something that uh, our Surgeon General said uh, in 2017. And it's something that there's been a, a spike in research right before uh, the uh, COVID-19. We know that loneliness and isolation are just flat out deadly. They're associated with depression, dementia and suicide, hypertension, heart disease, stroke and diabetes. Low social engagement contributes to Lack of physical activity, prolonged sitting time, unhealthy sleep, perceived depression and poor self uh, rated health and a low quality of life. And as people socially withdraw, you see a disconnection from peer uh, from peers and you have an increase in psychiatric symptoms and that the duration and degree of disconnection with your peers is associated with the degree of loneliness. So. Loneliness is, is something that uh, that uh, that is really uh, plaguing our country currently. Uh, studies have found that predictors of loneliness. Uh, this is not rocket science either here, but uh, you know, uh, predictors of loneliness are people who are unmarried, who have infrequent social contact, who are participating infrequently in religious activities, who are lacking club or organization affiliation. Those last two are really about participation. And uh, we also know, of course, that uh, social anxiety is highly associated uh, with higher, higher loneliness and then also leads to social media overuse and daily use of text based social media. So we must treat this seriously and, it, and as something that needs to be addressed systematically. And how do we combat loneliness? Well, first of all, we can normalize talking about it. Uh, one of the things uh, that um, uh, this is not necessarily coming out of research, but you know, there's a tendency to, to to sort of stigmatize the feeling of loneliness that the person is not cool enough to have friends and to participate with others, and that's really not a productive way of looking at this thing. This is truly an epidemic that uh, people are suffering from, so we need to normalize talking about feeling lonely, and 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 we need to be systematic about screening for it as well with our clients. 
We know that social support and meaningful daily activities uh, decrease loneliness and that, you know, uh, factors such as good relationships, family life, friendships, uh, being higher in age uh, and uh, being in a couple and balancing daily time are all good things to combat loneliness. But we need to be systematic here. We need a call of arms to address loneliness. It is such an issue across the world that in the UK in 2019, the e they created the Ministry of Loneliness. And, you know, people were laughing about it and thinking it was a little bit ridiculous, but no, it's not. Actually, they're ahead of the game. They figured it out. This needs to be addressed now. So how do we address it? Well, we know that belonging matters. Uh, research coming out of occupational therapy uh, and in Canada and occupational science really highlights the benefits of belonging. And it, it decreases loneliness, it increases self-esteem and uh, self-dignity. Uh, more importantly, people who feel belonging are open to starting new relationships. And we know all the positive effects of that. There are uh, people who feel like they belong to communities are motivated to go out and to participate. Remember that feeling needed is part of this belonging where you, you want to show up because you don't want to let other people down. I remember uh, during a training I did recently, uh, people were discussing how uh, they had lost the opportunity because of COVID to go to the gym. And they were very worried about, you know, the effect that it would have, uh, have on their physical health. And uh, the person reflected that after a while of not going to the gym, she realized that she had found the ability to meet her physical needs through the gym by working out at home. What she didn't realize that she had lost are all the social happenings while she went to the gym, all the people that she met that were she would see regularly, who she would have informal conversation with, uh, with and we would basically problem solve, share stories feel belonging, feel community, feel the social fabric of the gym. And this person reported that after uh, COVID-19 and, and doing a, a working out at home that she really realized how such activities were integral to her well-being. She didn't have that outlet anymore, but she was still meeting her physical needs. It's not just about the loss of doing, it's about the loss of doing with others. Um, okay. Different ways to experience belonging. This uh, study can also came out of uh, occupational therapy. Uh, we can think of social belonging, which is what I've been highlighting a lot here, uh, contributing to others and to community, uh, you know, having shared emotional connections. But there are other forms of belonging that are equally important and that we need to nurture for people to, to, to be called forth and to want to engage in their communities. There's that spatial belonging where you feel, really feel connected to the place or, or the, the land where you are. And a lot of times this can be done through objects and artifacts. Think, think about the belonging you can feel at home when you have all your stuff around you. Whereas when you're in, in a hotel and it's just flat and there's no personality to it, you may not feel like you belong there. Uh, we need to be encouraging existential and spiritual belonging, this idea of meaning, value, and transcendence and beliefs. A lot of people experience that through uh, participating in nature, uh, nature activities and participation in church. Um, but all in all, we know that uh, uh, what, what promotes that feeling uh, of belonging, uh, it's really important to reduce uh, loneliness and, and feeling excluded. It's important to, for people to feel a part of something bigger and to uh, feel a connection to shared purpose. So, you know, if someone is 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 needing to feel more belonging, uh, engaging them in shared advocacy or project groups could be a solution to enhance that belonging. Belonging is so important that it, one of the leading theories of justice in the world, the capabilities approach, holds it as one of the top 10 central human capabilities that society should support in their constituents. It's a measure of how of justice in a uh, in a society according uh, to the, uh, this uh, this body of, of, of justice work. So you see right here, uh, uh, I, I uh, included the text for uh, number seven there, affiliation, being able to live with and towards others, to recognize and show concern for other human beings, to engage in various forms of social interaction, having the social basis of self-respect, non-humiliation, and being able to be treated as a dignified being whose worth is equal to that of others. There's truly a need for that, and uh, certainly with folks with serious mental illness, the uh, the stigma against them um, is so tremendous that uh, most of them uh, argue that this feeling of belonging and affiliation is, is not something that they get to experience. Uh, I'll have you notice too that on number nine, it talks about play, which refers to leisure. Again, it's not something on the side that we get to do after work. It's something that keeps us able and stable to work. We could also argue 
that equitable participation is also a matter of justice due to the relationship between good health and participation. Remember that study I mentioned before uh, under leisure with that used the Pittsburgh enjoyable activities tests? Well, here are the 10 different areas that it was looking at. And you can see right here, there's really a wide uh, variety, you know, time alone, time unwinding, visiting with others, eating with others, doing fun things with others, being in clubs or groups, vacationing, commuting with nature, sports and hobbies. This Remember the study showed that high scores, which means a lot of participation in all these areas, translates to good mental and physical health. They also found, which I didn't mention in the last part, that higher socioeconomic status is correlated with high scores uh, on physical, I mean, on the, the Pittsburgh Enjoyable Activities Test. And this is, to, this is no surprise, it's just hard evidence showing that people who do not have the same privileges and economic standing do not have the same opportunity to participate in enjoyable activities of different ranges that are known to be correlated with health and well-being. And so tell me that's not an issue of justice there. So now occupational therapy and occupational justice uh, has come out uh, in occupational injustice. This is um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this is really a, a niche type of understanding for occupational therapists. And I know that uh, that's not necessarily who we're, uh, the crowd is uh, today. But uh, what I wanted to highlight here is occupational therapy uh, focuses on occupation and participation in meaningful activities. And so the forms of injustice related to participation here argues that equity and participation is needed because of its relationship to health. And we see that these four different forms of occupational injustice all lead to some form of social exclusion. Either you're feeling marginalized because your occupations are not valued, you're alienated from uh, from even being able to participate, you're deprived from participation, or you're, you're imbalanced, you have too much work or, or too much time on your hands. All of these things have been known to be related to poor health outcomes. And OT is not the only one saying it. The, there was a landmark study not too long ago that really highlighted this fancy term called social determinants of health. Surely you've heard about this now for now. But what it did, if you look at this bottom band right here, we're looking at health outcomes, mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, etc., uh, that they were directly related to these areas of, of, um, uh, of social living, economic stability, uh, the physical environment, education, food, context, and the healthcare system. But if you look in these uh, these different categories, you see where integ uh, social integration and community uh, and engagement are key. So those are forms of participation. You see walk uh, walkability, playgrounds, uh, having parks, all the types of things that uh, that actually enable you to participate. Uh, you have the things that give you the resources to participate, and then you have the, the things that give you opportunities to participate. All of those are social determinants of health. And so now that we're seeing, um, it, because of this landmark study, we're seeing more and more attention to social determinants of health in, in all areas of, of, of scholarship, which is terrific because this is obviously a major need. So indeed, the impact of COVID-19 has had a disproportional impact on folks who are marginalized and vulnerable who don't enjoy life situations full of the protective factors that, uh, as their more privileged counterparts. COVID has really highlighted these disparities. We know uh, the research is still coming out, right? Because uh, this just happened, but we know that loneliness increased significantly. The protective factors were similar to ones from before with no loneliness were, you know, being married, living with other adults and having a greater support, social support protect you against loneliness. But then the risk factors were being young, being separated or divorced, having major depressive disorder, poor sleep quality and difficulty regulating emotions. Because of COVID-19, we saw a mass withdrawal from meaningful activities. There was elevated suicidal ideation and increased uh, substance abuse, more than three times the higher prevalence of, um, of, uh, of depression, depressive symptoms. Of course, people with uh, fewer resources and low income were disproportionately affected, and uh, the, the further increase is expected. People who were homeless and with mental illness were at an extremely elevated risk. Uh, for example, you know, all the libraries co closed. So that didn't affect uh, many privileged people, but for uh, many low income and homeless people, uh, that was a, a, a major impact on them because many of them could not vote because they couldn't print the application for an absentee uh, ballot. They were not able to apply for SSDI, which is a social security uh, disability benefit because they couldn't get on the internet from the library. They couldn't apply for jobs because that was their only place to do it. And, and some couldn't uh, had to um, uh, forestall uh, engaging in education. 
So again, you know, could you imagine how this would have been uh, at a different time when the internet wasn't around? Well, that's what folks without access and privilege were experiencing. So what do we do? How do we support meaningful participation? We have a long history of ignoring the importance of participation. We're facing a loneliness epidemic and rising rates of mental illness, and then COVID hit. We need to act, but how? Well, one of the first steps we can do is to abandon traditional psychology, focus and embrace positive psychology. Traditional psychology has operated under a deficit approach for a long time, focusing on fixing symptoms and, and people in an attempt to cure illness, essentially attempting to conform people to normative behavioral standards. This really created a narrative of stigma and incapacity for adults experiencing mental illness. Positive psychology is quite the opposite. It's about maximizing positivity as opposed to minimizing negativity. It's also applicable to everyone, not just people who are uh, suffering from mental illness, because the focus is not on reducing or uh, getting rid of mental illness, but it's on promoting positive mental health. So you have to, the, the, um, the real focus of uh, positive psychology is on positive emotions, feeling good, engaging in absorbed activities, being connected to others through important relationships, purposeful existence, experiencing meaning, and having a sense of accomplish, uh, accomplishment, achievement. All these things are nurtured and experienced by participation in meaningful activities, social interaction, community integration. So treatment then shifts to focusing on strengths, which is then the foundation upon which you build the, ha the house, as opposed to minimizing deficits, which is really just telling a person, you're broken, you're wrong, we're gonna try to fix you, um, and we'll see what happens. Uh, so there's really, uh, with positive psychology, it's really about changing your, your view on, um, on everyday living and promoting a positive attitude. So when we're talking about working with adults with, uh, with mental illness, it's also useful to consider uh, SAMHSA's recovery model, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is a very large federal entity that, um, that does a lot for promoting um, uh, 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 mental illness uh, services uh, across the, um, the country. And so they have four dimensions of recovery that they've uh, they've embraced, and of course the first one's health. But then the ones that are that they also highlight are home, having a stable place to live, purpose, conducting meaningful daily activities. There's the list right there. The ability to participate in society, and then having community, not just being in it, but actually having relationships and social networks that provide not just support but friendship. Right, friends matter, love, and hope. So when we're we're really talking about a dramatic shift in how we view mental health. The focus again needs to be shift. We're focusing on wellness, not illness. We're not looking at symptom reduction. We're looking at helping people thrive. We have to look at recovery as a, as a process and not an outcome, right? There might be a reduction in symptoms, but it's really about the ability to manage the illness. And this looks different for everybody um, because recovering from the effects of mental illness and when I say the effects, it's the damage to social participation and relationships because of the symptoms is often more challenging than recovering from the symptoms themselves. In fact, often you talk to people uh, with serious mental illness and they tell you what are you ask them, what are their goals or what do they want to change? It's rarely I don't want to feel symptoms anymore or I, uh, I don't want to uh, be have this diagnosis anymore. It's it's at least in my personal experience and those with whom I've talked, uh, it's always I want a meaningful relationship. I want a job. I want uh, to have friends. I want to do the things that give everybody that 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 sense of life and, and thriving. So we're, we're no longer talking about conforming to normative standards, but just focusing on what brings each individual person mental health. So to develop this model, this model, SAMHSA created a working definition, and I'm just going to quickly uh, go over the some of the guiding principles so that you can see uh, what what they think is critical. So of course you got to think that recovery is real, but people must, it has to be person driven. People have to define their own goals. The pathways are highly personalized. It needs to be holistic and focused on family, housing, employment, transportation, education, community participation, social networks, faith, creativity, and you know, healthcare we know. Uh, Peer support's importance because of that sense of belonging that is created. Uh, it needs to be relational. Again, creating a sense of belonging, personhood, uh, personhood, empowerment, social inclusion, again, community participation. And it needs to address trauma because people tend to feel uh, a lot of trauma just having gone through um, uh, uh, psychiatry in the past. And uh, of course, focusing on strengths and personal, uh, personalized uh, uh, culture and respect and appreciation. Again, the, the, the other ones I, I mentioned, I think, are, are the key here. So 
Adopting those models is important. Supporting a person also involves knowing where they stand on understanding their personal needs. So another useful model to consider is the trans-theoretical model of health behavior change, right? Because it, it outlines some of the steps that help activate people in their behavior change, because often people are uh, unaware that there's something that is causing them a problem. So this is not about manipulating people as is suggested by the persuade and motivate uh, second step there on contemplate, contemplation. People can misinterpret this model of, of health behavior change as you basically manipulating people and changing their thinking. But what it's really about is, is, is understanding that people won't change unless they want to, and they need to see the point and that you need to be sensitive to that. So if a person is feeling poor emotional health and is unaware why, and then you also know that they're not participating in many meaningful activities, the approach then is to perhaps educate the person on the importance of meaningful participation. And that is addressing the person at the pre-contemplation stage that maybe you could persuade them to participate to meet their needs. We know that intervention can improve participation in associated health. We know that interventions that target participate improve it. Uh, for example, uh, in this study with uh, elders in assisted living, they they uh, took a group uh, to help children with uh, with uh, their literacy, and uh, all the measures showed that the the participants had increased physical, social, and cognitive activities. Even four to eight months after uh, the follow up, there was more physical activity, more strength, more social resources, uh, resources, and their walking speed had decreased less than the control group. This last point here, it's tremendous, but it was just under stati statistical significance, so I probably shouldn't bring it up, but it's just too neat of an idea, so just know that this one isn't quite as solid, but there was over 50% reduction in falls. Again, not it was just under st statistical significance, and that the control group actually had an increase in falls in that time, which is tremendous. We know that uh, pr activity provision for people with dementia leads to uh, improvements in mental and physical health. Uh, this study right here found that spiritual and religious activities meant the need for death preparation. Intergenerational activities needed were about the need for uh, connecting intergenerationally with uh, youth. Reacquaintance with past leisure activities fostered that sense of control and achieving life goals. And pursuing new activities fostered that need to be creative. And uh, the study found that there were just positive health outcomes for, for people with dementia just by providing activities. Again, participation is the key here. So indeed, engaging with the community is a major and it is life changing. And it's also difficult for people who have a hard time doing it. We know, according to research, that it helps the recovery for people with serious mental illness. Their involvement in activities with friends enables them to see themselves as differently, to break that narrative of stigma that traditional psychology has given them, where you were told at the beginning, you have this serious mental illness, you will not be able to succeed, you will not be able to work, you probably won't marry. Those are all false things, but are all things that are told to people with serious mental illness. And so many times they, there's a need, there's this apathy and there's this uh, being you know pushed down so often that it's hard for you to engage. So there's a need to, to, to support people and having opportunities to see themselves as more than just a patient so they can experience new roles, a new identity, and just an opportunity to craft a self that they like as opposed to other people crafting the self for them as a person with mental illness who is deficient. But it's not just about providing activities, right? It needs to be meaningful and social. We need to build the quality of relationships. People need to feel that their uh, contribution to the relationship is valued. Um, in a recent study that one of my doctoral students just did with uh, ch uh, children and teenagers with ASD, uh, this wasn't the focus of the study, but we found stati statistically significant results related to this uh, aspect, that at a younger age, uh, the children in our study were much more interested in how many friends they had, and that that was what matters most, but that as they transitioned into later teenagehood, there was already a shift happening there, and they had fewer friends, but valued the quality more, which I think is really interesting already at that age that that's a thing. Uh, in a study at a long-term care facility right here, we see that the number of activities did not affect life satisfaction or adjustment to the facility. It was self-generated activities with others that made that change. So you can't just show up and just give somebody activities. That's not going to work. It needs to be a collaborative effort where you're really trying to find things that are meaningful. So increasing a sense of belonging is obviously a good strategy here. How do we do it? Well, the social belonging, you know, you sit down with somebody and you try to identify small changes where the person can feel like they are needed or valuable. You find opportunities to find those connections. In terms of spatial belonging, you find out what a person, where they feel comfortable and try to identify what aspects of that environment are, are what in increasing that spatial belonging. And then you try to identify other uh, spaces that, that have that similar feeling to increase that person's participation. Same thing with activities and spaces that create 
create that existential or spiritual belonging. The bottom line is that you really want a person involved with groups uh, and, and improving um, and engaging in their community. We know this can work. Increasing activity participation, uh, participation improves health and education outcomes in children and adolescents too. In fact, uh, one study showed that moving from non-participation to engaging in sports and other extra extracurricular activities had uh, related, uh, resulted, I'm sorry, in better mental health and that this was entirely mediated by higher levels of peer belonging. So it wasn't the actual physical engagement that led to the mental health, it was the peer belonging and support that led to the mental health. Other studies have shown that a participation in a wide range of activities lead to better academic and behavioral uh, outcomes and that these outcomes improve with increased participation. The clubhouse model uh, for adults with serious mental illness is based on this very principle where uh, social inclusion or belonging are there to promote people's help, where people show up, involve, engage each other in a work order day and support each other, where they are giving and being needed and receiving and needing others. And, um, and that uh, despite its importance and recognized importance, I mean, uh, there's still poor funding in it because uh, we're still pumping all of our money into inpatient mental health. So why are we so bad at addressing social participation? The reason has nothing to do with its importance. It's really about policy, funding, and systems dominated by the medical model. Uh, we've prioritized neuro and traditional psychology despite little evidence of, of improved outcomes. So why is this so? Well, social determinants are political, so studying them is actually very complicated. There's a danger of paternalism. The, the range of potential intervention targets is so wide that it's difficult to study, and the need for individual ad adaptation makes it almost impossible to develop protocols. So that makes it very complicated. Also, the NIMIMH is partially responsible here. A recent study that just came out showed that they are spending all their money on researching basic science and not treatment. Between 2003 and 2019, there was a 90% reduction in treatment trials for uh, adults with SMI. That is horrible, okay? Uh, basic science is important, but we also need to be translating those to treatment. So in sum, the system is not enough. It's not working to prevent, to prevent increases in the rates of mental illness. So we need to support each other. How do we do that? Well, part of it's mental health awareness, right? Talking about it, supporting each other, actively listening, uh, normalize talking about mental illness. If you have difficulty with mental, uh, uh, mental distress or mental illness, talk to people about it. Make your relationships reciprocal. It's okay to be needed by somebody. That, is what other people need. They want to help you. They want to be there to help you. Do things together and just reach out. So, you know, I'm not gonna introduce a very quick little uh, 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 OT intervention that was developed in Canada for uh, a sort of community treatment teams, but I'm gonna uh, go over it pretty quickly to give you an idea of how we can use these kinds of things to support uh, participation. It's only like $30, I think. I get zero money, by the way, from that. It's in Canada. I'm not at all affiliated, so there's no conflict of interest here, but I'm advocating for it because I think it's a cheap and useful way of looking at participation and getting people to engage with their communities. So what's so neat about it is it guides through this whole collaborative evaluation process with all these worksheets that make you look at your activity patterns, look at the benefits of activities, and uh, try to assess how that impacts your 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 well-being. So you 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 know you do daily you look at daily time use, you look at your balance, are you getting enough physical activity? You look at your routines, uh, are you experiencing meaning, satisfaction? Are those activities involving social interaction? Are you accessing your community? Uh, these are all important things to consider. So these worksheets are very basic, but they're also a great guide. Another thing that this uh, intervention advocates for is uh, starting small. Anyone who's really stuck in the inertia and not sufficiently part participating, it kind of feeds itself in the cycle. So it's really difficult to pull yourself out of being stuck. So you really want to just do the just right challenge, something that's really easy for somebody to get involved with, and then they can build their momentum and confidence. So you want to start thinking about activity experiments, you know, maybe do it just once a week, something that's easy meaningful, doesn't require many resources, and is also sensitive to the person's context. To detect these things, these activity experiments, try to think about an activity map, like what's around a person. Consider their transportation needs, how transportation might be a barrier itself, their financial needs as well, how finances can be a barrier. Uh, if a person really is stuck and not participating, explore their past interests and activities. That might show you some, some ideas, some clues about what, what um, memorable stories and valued activities the person had that might be uh, worth reinstigating. Look at their possessions, ask about their significance. Identify important people in the person's life and what activities they used to do with that person because 
participating in activities with them may be motivating, but it also give you a clue to the things that matter to the person and it might give some ideas of what to do. Of course, you know, when you're working with uh, people you don't know as well, you need to consider culture, you know, in the time of day and time of week that these things are good to do. Uh, one way, if a person uh, is not opening uh, up to you and asking about the or talking about these things, you can ask them just what's the difference between a good day and a not so good day. And then you try to find out what was in that good day. Was it the fact that you got up every day and showered? Was it the fact that you uh, had a, a certain meal with a friend and you try to, you know, repeat that? It's always important to respect the dignity of risk of people. We have a tendency to be overprotective of individuals with disabilities. Uh, we want to avoid stress because the idea is that if someone gets stressed, they experience exacerbation of symptoms and end up hospitalized. But actually taking risks is necessary to participate. So it's not about ignoring risk, though. It's about learning to manage risk. We, if we avoid risk at all costs, we avoid opportunities to thrive. So risk management is important. So I'm going to point you to this excellent resource, uh, uh, Temple University, uh, the Temple University Community Collaborative uh, on uh, Community Mental Health, uh, led by Dr. Salzer. Um, and uh, he came up with this blueprint for community inclusion with uh, Australia called Well Together. It's a fantastic uh, resource. There are so many resources there in promoting a community participation, but I'm going to focus on the risk management piece because of what we were just talking about. But I highly encourage you to check out their website. They have these really cool tools where uh, someone who is, again, stuck and scared to get out because of the risk, they guide you where you can you know, identify a goal that you want to do, and then you can start looking at your strengths, your resources, what risks you see, are those risks really severe, and are they worth taking? And then you can look at other forms. Coming up with a plan, you identify the risks, you have which uh, supports uh, you have to address those risks, maybe additional supports that are needed, and how you actually have an action step to address those, those, um, those risks. And then you have another support plan where you have the uh, what if scenario. What if everything, what if it hits the fan? What if a crisis happens? What is there a plan? Are there supports for the plan? And then you, get, you come back and you reevaluate. You look at the uh, the risks in the action step and you say, what happened? What worked? What didn't work? What was learned? What do we do next time? All this stuff is not rocket science again, but it helps us cognitively structure our thinking such that we are able to uh, deal with very complicated thoughts. It's very difficult to think about these things abstractly and verbally, but writing it down concretely and, and, and making structure out of it makes it much more uh, easy to process. In action over inertia, they uh, have very similar thing for uh, assessing act, um, activity experiments where you know you would uh, you would ask a person how, uh, how did ex uh, your experience compare to what you thought was ha would happen? What did you learn? What did you enjoy? What was the best part? What was the most challenging? Did it change your routine? Did it give you any new ideas for experiments and what could have made it better? So the last little bit that I'm going to say, and this is going to be very quick. I know I'm running over time. Uh, is this idea about supporting participation with technology because this was tremendously important during COVID. Again, could you imagine what the impact would have been had this pandemic hit 15 years ago? Well, the truth is, is that uh, a lot of people who didn't have access to technology, that's what they felt like and they were completely isolated. Uh, but we know that social media and the internet uh, can be an extremely useful resource when needed. Um, you see right here uh, uh, on meetup.com is it's just a really neat uh, type of, uh, of website. There's many of these things available where you can find just local activities in the area according to whatever hobbies or interests you have. Um, and it's, it's uh, for each individual location, which is uh, really uh, a great way to find uh, new groups, things that you're interested in, potentially people who share similar interests. We know that virtual participation can 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 e is easy it's not the same okay and then increase if you do too much screen time it is associated with increased loneliness so you don't want to like overly depend on uh, on technology and screens it's because you know there's something about that embodied experience of socially being there present with somebody breathing there with them that's different but seeing somebody virtually is better than not seeing anybody at all um and so uh, I, I have the privilege of working at the uh, UNC Chapel Hill Center for Excellence in Community Mental Health. And so we, we work with a lot of uh, community dwelling adults with serious mental illness. And we did a smartphone distribution project during this to give people access to telehealth because they couldn't see their, um, their, uh, their, their providers. And so we made sure that they had smartphones that they could teleconference with, but we also seized that to promote their participation because 
These are things they told us they needed. And so we created all these socials and these wellness activities. Here's just a quick list. I don't want to read them all, uh, but we did really cool things. You know, we did trips to zoo museums. We uh, did virtual train rides. We played games. We played game like uh, Wheel of Fortune. There were talent shows, uh, pet shows, uh, you know, guessing music, scavenger hunts, karaoke, book clubs, movie nights, just watching stuff together, dancing, uh, cooking together. Um, and then, you know, of course, the, of course, the more uh, traditional wellness types of activities were provided there. We did, actually did living skill interventions, uh, some guided meditation, you know, Qigong, Tai Chi, uh, muscle relaxing, relaxation, and so on. So there's a great amount of potential there, but it, it does not replace the in-person piece. So in summary, very quickly, meaningful participation matters. Don't get healthy to participate. Participate to get healthy. Remember, it's bi-directional. You can't wait to, to stabilize. You have to participate to be stabilized and to thrive. We know it's closely associated with positive and uh, mental and physical health outcomes. It contributes to authentic friendships and belonging, like really meaningful friendships. And we know that that also contributes to positive mental health and physical health. And we know that the quality is more important than the quantity, right? And that people need to be needed. So it's not a burden on people. Uh, you know, just a real quick aside on that needing to be needed. I'll never forget uh, when I was working in inpatient psychiatry, a state, um, a state psychiatric hospital. So people were here for a long time with chronic mental illness. And I, uh, I really injured my foot and I was on crutches. And um, they probably wouldn't allow this anymore. But I was, you know, on the unit, a lockdown unit uh, on my crutches. And people were climbing over each other, patients, to open the doors for me, to carry my stuff. Uh, because there's just that inherent need to feel important to feel like you matter and that if you weren't there, it would be important and it would matter. So meaningful participation should be a priority. Don't forget those activity experiments. Give people the dignity of risk, to, but, but engage in risk management, right? Just not blind risk, right? But and most importantly, our mental health system is not providing the care to all of us. It's, it's good at, re at responding, it's doing nothing well for preventative. So we need to support each other and that is through meaningful participation. So this whole thing, I have a bunch of references for all you to look at. This, these are all the references that I used, pages and pages of it. And I thank you. And I guess it's time for the question and answer session. Should I stop sharing my screen? <laughs> Hi, Dr. Antoine. Thank you so, so much for your lecture. That was great. Um, kind of at the basic pieces here, several people have asked if you would be willing to share references in any way or not, and also uh, PowerPoint handouts. Oh, so, absolutely. Okay, great. So yes. afterwards, we'll figure out how to do that and we'll make sure that we are able to get those to everybody who's in the audience. So yes, thank you. Uh, that, the, uh, I, I realize I have a lot of information on my slides and that, um, th that the purpose of that is for these things to be a resource. I do a lot of trainings for uh, community mental health providers. And so that's the idea is we, we give these things as resources and that, um, you know, it's a little overwhelming to have all that information, but at the same time, it gives you a terrific literature review uh, after the actual talk. Great, and truly a lot of resources that I think people can interact with. So for those of you in the audience, continue to post your questions uh, in the Q&A, and we will begin to kind of uh, ask Dr. Balliard some of those questions. So. One, two of them I'd like to kind of start with earlier in your presentation. You had, uh, when you started, shared some statistics about the increase in mental health. And so one of the questions is, do we have any sense of what undiagnosed statistics look like uh, for undiagnosed mental health issues? Well, that's, you know, that's a great question. I don't think we have any reliable statistics on that. I mean, not that I'm aware of, there may be out there, but the truth is, is of course, it's it's larger than what's reported because that's just what's measured. The stigma against mental illness is so intense that people will do anything to not be labeled and uh, people will suffer silently, uh, often with something that could be diagnosed, but they just power through it because they don't want 
they want don't want to go on medications for instance i mean there's a huge stigma against uh, going on medication for any mental health issue you know if you if you experience anxiety you're you're uh, you're portrayed as being unable to handle the stress if you experience depression you're just you know not seeing the joys of life it's not like that right uh and so people have this impression that uh, uh they shouldn't have mental illness that it's a weakness and so they'll do everything to deny it to themselves and i i'm i'm 100 percent sure there's a lot of silent suffering out there yes and perhaps the increase in uh, percentage that we're seeing now is because there is more awareness maybe maybe the needle is moving a little bit and the the stigma is going down a little bit perhaps um but you know now that I, I the more i think about that the you know the increases in serious mental illness uh, are unlikely to be uh, uh, due to more awareness because uh, those uh it's just such an intense uh, impact on function that um, there's something else going on there Right, right. Great. Thank you. And um, can you, you've talked throughout your presentation about meaningful participation and meaningful activities. Can you share your thoughts maybe again on and more concisely with what makes an activity meaningful? Oh, that's a terrific question, right? It's like the golden question in OT. Uh, so I would probably be able to teach a, a semester long seminar on this very topic. <laughs> yes. So I will, I, I'm unable to give you a concise answer, but I will say a few things. First of all, um, it's different for everybody. So certainly one thing you can't assume is that whatever is meaningful to you, for whatever reason it's meaningful to you, it's not the same for everybody. Um, you know, some of the studies we, uh, we have done, uh, I, I do a lot of research in, in sensory um, uh, sensory aspects of engagement and activity, mm -hmm. and uh, there I found uh, I'll be presenting on this tomorrow as well. But that uh, basically, you know, we tend to embody our our, our sensory environments in ways uh, through meaning, like we're interacting with somebody socially that is important to us, and you know, because of our allostatic demands at birth, you know, we we really value social participation with our caregivers, and that as we continue to interact with our caregivers, we start to embody their ways of being uh, their sensory somatic attention in terms of like habits of sensing of looking at the world and uh, and prioritizing certain things and seeing things as meaningful or not. A perfect example of this actually now that I'm saying it is um, I have twins. The other day I was out in my in my yard and um, this was actually more than the other day, but for story purposes, the other day I was out in my yard and I I, I was pointing up uh, to them. I was like, oh, look at this. Look at that. Uh, it's so pretty. Look at this. Um, uh, I was pointing at the uh, the sun going down, right? And and, and always highlighting the uh, the sunset. And then before long, the kids were doing it to me. And so to them, all of a sudden, the meaningfulness and that was our shared participatory sense making in that moment together, meaningful, uh, a moment we we shared orientation towards the environment in a certain way that became embodied such that the next time uh, my kids encountered that same configuration the fact that it was similar to that meaningful interaction with me uh, was then meaningful to them I, I i hope i explained that in a logical way there yes and i really appreciate that it it is something and you you talked uh tonight about how it's small steps and it's really interacting with the person and collaborating to to discover really some of those so that's right that's great yeah super so what do you think are some of the key factors to consider when planning mental health interventions for large groups of people particularly in a work environment. Hmm. So how do we help enhance mental health through facilitating work self-esteem, competence, mastery? So this is very interesting because I just wrote a big grant on employment uh, for oh. adults with serious mental illness. This is actually really on top of my mind right now. And uh, so I have some statistics for you all off the top of my head. Uh, in a major study done in 2015, Judith Cook, who is uh, really high up in doing uh, this kind of research on employment, uh, was part of this major uh, uh, national study of uh, different interventions to do uh, to promote employment. And they found that the, the main reason uh, people uh, um, left their jobs was because they were dissatisfied people weren't getting fired people were leaving the jobs because they didn't like it and so what we, what we found uh in reading more into this uh these studies was that actually uh people are being uh employment services for adults with serious mental illness uh 
tend to place people in positions um, uh, that are not necessarily well uh, suited to their sensory needs and their their just their just their interests. Job dissatisfaction is the number one reason for a job separation for adults with serious mental illness. So I guess you know the um, when if I were planning uh, <laughs> a large scale intervention, I would uh, first of all restructure the payment structure that over reimburses. Uh, job placement as opposed to job tenure. So teams tend to get more money for putting somebody in work, but they get less money as the person moves along the process. So there's less incentive on finding a good match because you need the income to just find any match. Uh, so the emphasis, uh, first of all, on a policy level would be to change the payment structure such that uh, meeting um, certain milestones after employment would be more rewarded so that there'd be more incentive to keep people in jobs that they liked since job dissatisfaction was the major issue. Another thing I would do is really embrace that positive psychology approach and the recovery approach and uh, you know throw away all these ideas about normative expectations for people um, because you know what uh, they don't really work for typical people anyway and um, you know I would really uh, uh, focus on um, Finding, uh, you know, strength-based approach. Finding what people want, what they're good at, and 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 constructing jobs around that, as opposed to placing people in existing positions. If that makes any sense. Absolutely. This is all really big thinking here, because you know the the hurdles to overcome uh, those barriers to achieve that are are ridiculously large. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So here's an even bigger question for oh, you, great. Antoine. <laughs> We're having some great questions that are coming through. They are good. If, if you could redesign our healthcare system to incorporate these ideas that you've been talking about tonight, um, like increasing participation and promoting belonging, uh, what would what would those changes look like? Any any thoughts as you've been dreaming about that and working yeah. on this? So my, my my big dream would be to redo the whole system. Actually, I would start with redoing uh, schools and education, and I would uh, completely change because uh, this is actually all related. Uh, and I would um, uh, if we start early and and really um, get people involved in doing occupations in school, uh, uh, sort of like the way John Dewey uh, originally conceived of education and being more of an explorative type of process where you would find uh, children would learn through gardening, children would learn through cooking, they would learn math through these activities. So we would be, uh, we would first change the system to not focus on these testing outcomes, which we are increasingly finding are just not good measures at all. I mean, there are measures, they're objective in some sense, but they're not measuring what we want them to measure. Um, so we would first change that and then emphasize uh, through this education, really highlight the importance of participation, the importance of meaningful engagement with others and with your environment as a way to experience health and, um, and well-being. So then and that would then change the people who design policy and the people who design the system so that their priorities would be more on prevention and wellness as opposed to responsiveness to disease and illness, right? Because right now our system is reactive. It's not preventative. There's a good reason for that because it's extremely impossible to prove through research that a preventative measure stops something because you don't know if it would have occurred anyway. So, you know, the research is it's really difficult to convince lawmakers to pump money into that kind of a system, but uh, that's that's like the the grand project that I would uh, I would just redesign the whole system, education, and then subsequently the healthcare that comes from that system. I think you are going to uh, have many people who are willing to kind of jump on with you in that process of trying to change <laughs> well, the I system. Wish. So that's <laughs> great. Yeah. So uh, taking a little bit of a different focus, uh, this goes back to, and I appreciate your comments about COVID and how it really has brought many things to light. This, this talk is so timely. Mm -hmm. But uh, the question is, a uh, person is wondering if you have any insights about how social relationship changes. Uh, developing stronger bonds over similar, similar beliefs about COVID or disconnecting with people due to different beliefs about COVID. So it's kind of illustrating maybe perhaps the more complex and how that has influenced our mental stability. Wow, that is a big question because this yeah. has been a term, like I, I've seen this happen locally. I've heard it happen in plenty of places. People have lost friends. People have lost family members, uh, not not like through, you know, uh, the, the illness itself, but through different because everything's so politicized now. Right. And uh, that that it's really related to some conflicts. 
And, um, you know, I, there's there's definitely a lot of sadness uh, and loss that I think people experienced through this. Um, and that perhaps one of the things that one of the ways we, this could have all been mitigated were if we were all still together and participating together, because then maybe these issues wouldn't have become so um, wouldn't have exploded and been the focus of our of our relationships and we would have still been experiencing together participation as our relationships so that when this challenge on different perceptions of COVID had come that we still had those other parts of our relationship that we were nurturing whereas you know it's possible that because of COVID and our separation that our separation uh, our, our relationships may have gotten weaker or we have forgotten why they're meaningful uh, through these activities that we would do with people and then when we were reintroduced with those person uh, it immediately focused on this very divisive issue uh, that maybe we had forgotten what those meaningful relationships were really about and then it became about this divisive issue so like I wonder you know and I'm completely making this up right but I just wonder how different would this have been if people had been more able to maintain some kind of meaningful contacts with the very people with whom they had these these arguments later on? Um, so I don't have an answer. I really don't. Uh, but one thing I will say is that, you know, the research does say that uh, quality is more important than quantity. And, you know, perhaps some of those relationships, um, as painful as it is to lose them, maybe it was OK to lose them. Um, but, you know, that's that's really it's really difficult to, to to predict that kind of a thing. That's an excellent question. I think we'll we'll know a lot more about that uh, as time as time goes on. Right, right. Here is a focus of a different question. Um, how do we change the focus of systems that serve those with the most chronic severe mental illness? Uh, the state behavioral health hospitals. Uh, to understand that we have to prioritize participation and perhaps even transition services uh, that continue to be so hyper focused on safety, right? And and the oh, risk yes. management piece that you talked about. Um, and so, how do we help get away from that? Uh, in those systems. Yeah, the, the person who asked the question is obviously working in that system because I felt I could feel those emotions. I, I, I experienced this, this same tension for a very long time before I, I got into academia. Um, and it's a really big tension. So one thing I will say that is really hard about the situation you're describing is when you're working in inpatient, the people that you work with tend to have a very jaded view of uh, their patients. And uh, this is just over like over time, you end up just seeing people in moments of crisis and you end up, uh, especially in inpatient like acute, right? You see people always when they're they're really distressed, when they're really suffering. And uh, the, a lot of the professionals there then get this idea that this person's sort of like this all the time, even though they don't, you know, they know that that's not true, they get this idea. And so then they get, um, they uh, start uh, uh, devaluing what that person can actually do. So I would do these interventions and work on employment and work on education, um, excuse me, with uh, with some people in, in, in patient psychiatry like that. And then I would always get people uh, come after uh, and say, why are you working on a, uh, a job with this guy? He, there's no way he could uh, hold down a job. Or why are you even working towards finding education? You're raising his hopes for nothing. This guy will never have uh, an ability to, uh, to, to, to engage in education. And so there really is a lot of stigma in these institutions and they don't know it. Uh, it's like this this in, this stigma that has been nurtured over time, that's been internalized because they haven't interacted with enough people with serious mental illness in the community who are thriving and successful. And so maybe one of the strategies, now that I keep talking about this and talking about the problem, is to really expose uh, the people in those, uh, those institutions, the, the providers, to lots of success stories Maybe you could create like a, a monthly or weekly kind of uh, meeting where people just get to listen to successful uh, stories of people uh, in the community. Maybe even invite some folks with serious mental illness to talk about their successes in the community so you can start changing this perception and that maybe, uh, you know, associating that uh, with all this, you know, lovely literature that we keep talking about how participation is so important. Maybe you can then move the needle a little bit on them seeing that, OK, not only is this form of participation important, but it's also actually possible for this group. I didn't know it was possible because the ones I'm working with, they don't show that ability and it's because they're being beaten down and stigmatized in the moment, right? Uh, whereas this group here has the same illness and they're thriving in the community. So like maybe those kinds of like, what would be, um, I don't know, like lunch meetings or uh, kind of discussions would be a really good way to to, to change the that narrative. 
I really appreciate that. And it um, reminds me of kind of taking more of a strength based approach. Right. Absolutely. So we're sharing these very positive narratives to help people see what can happen and yes. and that ability. So here is a question for you around justice and injustice. Occupational deprivation and injustice is so profound in the prison population. Oh, yes. Do you have any recommendations for meaningful occupations and participation in that environment? Well, I, I mean, absolutely. The the list goes on. People should be engaged in some form of, an, of another. The, the problem with the, the, the whole Again, this is a, a macro level issue. The, the, the issue with the prison system is that too many people um, are into the, the the punishment side of it and that the rehabilitation side of it is not given enough focus. So uh, it's really hard to move the needle uh, on, on providing opportunities for rehabilitation and reintegration when so many of your policymakers and, and uh, lawmakers are more interested in the punishment side because they'll be like, why are you giving all this limited so-called limited money to this group who's done something wrong and because they're there because they need to be punished right when we both we all know that that's actually the it's a ridiculous uh, approach going to prison is horrible no one wants to go there okay so i don't care how many activities you provide a person in prison they're not going to be happy because they're uh, separated from the social environment but if you don't give them opportunities to do things to participate then you also lead to boredom loneliness so you're exacerbating mental health issues and then you also lead to skill uh, atrophy so people just start losing the ability to do anything i mean Skills are just like muscles. If you don't exercise them, you get worse at it. And, um, you know, if, if we don't give people those opportunities, then what are we expecting in terms of community re uh, reintegration? So, you know, um, I can't say that there's like just one approach because obviously everybody has such uh, different needs. But I think the, the real important issue there is to revisit the punishment versus um, rehabilitation. Excellent. Thank you. So have you looked at the importance of choice in social participation? Uh, the person says, I feel like this is a huge challenge in addressing social participation in many of the community mental health services. Yes, I mean, it's critical. Choice is critical. It has to be person centered. And if it's going to be meaningful, the person has to have the choice. And um, yeah, yeah that's why everything has to be collaborative. You can't just go in there with an idea and know what a person wants to do. That's why when I introduced the trans theoretical model behavior change, I did it very cautiously. You notice that I wasn't like, yes, you go in and this person doesn't want this behavior change. You're the expert. You know that's what they need. So it's up to you to manipulate them and convince them and educate them such that they will lead there. It, it's, it's much more fine tuned. It's really about this collaborative approach of figuring out what actually matters to that person that is also health promoting, right? Um, so choice is key. You know, when I, whenever I would work on uh, self-regulation strategies, you know, those classic deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation type activities that everyone likes to uh, do in mental health, um, I would certainly introduce those, but I would also spend a lot of time exploring what the person used to do themselves their own personal strategies, because guess what? We're all weird people and we all have these weird things we like to do that actually are stress reduction for us. And you know, if you can tap into something that someone's been doing like that, then you have found something that is much more easier, much uh, more likely to be implemented than imposing um, uh, a one way of, for regulating emotions. So in my opinion, uh, choice has to be a part of it. I mean, it's, it can't not be a part of it especially if you take a justice perspective. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we are running out of time, so this will be our last question. I apologize ahead of time. We're not gonna get to all of the questions, but um, we have one last question. Do you have any particular advice for occupational therapy students who are just getting ready to head out to level two field work? Uh, in an inpatient psych rotation in a state hospital. And oh, so I uh, might just, that got real specific. I might got, expand yeah. that out to those people who are working uh, with mental health. Yeah, so, you know, if it, when you're in a field work situation, obviously your clinical instructor is gonna be a, an important person to collaborate with though. W uh, but I will say one thing, one of the most important things I did in inpatient psych wasn't actually OT. It was treating people with dignity and humanity. It was sitting down and actually listening to somebody as opposed to me coming in and doing my eval. Um, I mean, I would still do the eval. I would still write the goals. I would still do all that lovely OT stuff, but 
the the part that I got most feedback from from the people, the patients with whom I was working, it was like they were always saying like, thank you for just listening. Everyone just comes in and just gets their, they extract their information. They come in, they do their intervention uh, because, you know, your productivity, 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 you got to get those units in. And if you don't get those units in, your manager's going to get on you. And then if the manager doesn't get those units in, then their manager's going to get on them. So there's a lot of pressure, uh, but that translates to poor care. And uh, if I have the time, I'll share a very quick uh, situation example on why this is so important. One time I got a referral for a young gentleman with uh, psychosis who hadn't showered in uh, you know, a very long time. You could tell his hair was long and it was very stringy. He had strong body odor and they just couldn't get him to shower. And uh, they were like, okay, well, we'll try OT. And I showed up and um, I sat down uh, and instead of just immediately trying to get him to shower, I literally just sat there and listened and didn't say a word for a long time and found out before too long, uh, because I was actually actively listening, he had been sexually molested in the shower. And so he was scared to take a shower in an unfamiliar place. So all it took was me to say, hey, you wanna just leave the door open and I'll sit outside right here in the door, make sure no one comes in. He was like, yeah, and he took a shower. So, you know, I guess you could call that OT, uh, but it was really about listening and valuing him as a, as a human and uh, showing him that he, he deserves to be treated with dignity. Um, and I, I think that's, uh, you know, that's the, that's how you should treat everyone, of course. And, uh, you know, it's one of the biggest lessons of, of, of just being alive, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And at this time. Well, Dr. Antoine Bayer, thank you so, so very much for your thoughtful presentation and really helping us to see how we need to continue to shift towards really helping people thrive and allowing people to engage and connect with other people. So I'd also uh, just ask the audience to do a virtual applause for Dr. Bowyer. Thank you, thank you. Sorry we can't hear it, but I'm sure it's going on. <laughs> oh, I wish I was there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do too. And I'd also like to thank uh, each of you in our audience for joining tonight. I appreciate you taking the time to join with us. I trust that you'll be able to use some of the information that Dr. Balliard has shared and remember some of the conversations we've had that really shed light on the importance of all of us engaging in meaningful activities to promote our mental health and wellness and belonging, as well as those that we live with, that we care for, and that we interact with. So thank you so very much. Um, we will, as we've talked earlier, uh, send all of you who uh, have been here an email probably next week sometime where we will go ahead and share uh, Dr. Balliard's references and PowerPoint. And we will also have the presentation captioned and available for recording. So if you had difficulty tonight, uh, don't fear, you'll have a chance to uh, listen and perhaps re-listen to Dr. Balliard. I think there's much in there. I look forward to listening again. So thank you all for participating in the evening with us. And this concludes tonight's Mary Scott Lecture. Thank you for having me.